Good evening, everyone. Today we are going to commence the picture test tutorials. Okay, we are going to talk on some of these topics today and highlight on some of them and subsequently we will discuss the others. An enlarged thyroid gland is called goiter. Goiter is an enlarged The goiter is defined as an enlarged thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is situated in the anterior neck and it weighs about 7 to 25 kg. And usually this gland is impalpable and not visible. But when it is enlarged, the gland becomes palpable and visible and that is called goiter. So it's an abnormally enlarged gland. So you should know what a goiter is. Now, the types of goiter or classification of goiters, generally when question comes related to the types, you should know generally they are classified as Simple goiters. Toxic goiters. Or plastic goiters. And inflammatory goiters. Okay. These are the various classes of goiters. What is a simple goiter? Now, there are three key words you need to know about simple goiters. There are three key words you need to remember regarding simple goiters. There are goiters that are not hyper thyroid. not hypo thyroid neither are they malignant they are neither malignant now simple goiters are not hyperthyroid they are not hypothyroid they are neither malignant so there's an anterior neck swelling there are no features of toxicity Okay, there are no features of hyperthyroidism, no features of hypothyroidism, okay, and no features of malignancy. They just have an anterior neck swelling, which progressively increases in size, or it may even remain static without growing. Now you should know that. <clears throat> the most important reason why patients come to the hospital for anterior neck swelling, the commonest indication why they come seeking for treatment is for cosmetic reason. It's because of cosmesis. So majority of them will have simple goiters. Okay that may not have symptoms, okay? May not have any pressure symptoms, may not have any toxic symptoms, but because there is a swelling that is growing uh, on their neck, it will cause a form of disfigurement in that patient. So they request for treatment. So any goiter without all these features are called uh, simple goiters. And you should know generally, when talking about simple goiters, they are broadly categorized into two types. You should know simple goiters are broadly categorized into two types. 
these are endemic and sporadic. Okay, endemic goiters are goiters that affect up to 10% of the population in a community. That is endemic goiter. It affects up to 10% of the population in a community. Now, you should know in endemic goiters, there's a common risk factor in that community that predisposes the community to risk, while sporadic goiters occur randomly in a community. Now, toxic goiters, toxic goiters could either be diffuse toxic, they could either be nodular, okay? The nodular goiters could be solitary nodule or multinodular. So generally, these toxic goiters, they have symptoms and they are manifestation of the symptoms of hyperthyroidism, features of thyroid toxicosis because of excessive elaboration of the hormones that are produced by this gland. And these hormones in general, they potentiate the effect of catecholamines. Hence, they will be having excessive sympathetic symptoms because of an elaborated actions of catecholamines. At the same time, because the hormones they produce stimulate hypermetabolism, they also present with symptoms of hypermetabolism. Okay, so these are toxic goiters and you should know there are types of thyrotoxicosis, the primary thyrotoxicosis and the secondary thyrotoxicosis. We have a lecture that talks about that in detail. You can go scroll down through our previous lectures on goiter and you go and um, watch the detail of that discussion. Neoplastic goiters, <clears throat> the malignant ones are the ones of concern here. Now, malignant goiters, usually <clears throat> they could either be papillary, okay? You should know the malignant goiters. Okay, let's... The malignant goiters could either be It could either be papillary, it could be follicular, it could be medullary, it could be anaplastic. Now, briefly, you should know this is the commonest type worldwide. However, in our environment or West African subregion, we tend to see follicular thyroid cancer being commoner because this first one is something that results from exposure to radiation. Okay, while this is something that results from a long standing multinodular goiter. This usually can be syndromic and they have family history. Anaplastic are very aggressive and you have undifferentiated type. We also have a detailed lecture on this. You can go back and watch that. But you should know these have lymphatic spread. These have vascular spread. Vascular lymphatic, or lymphatic, this direct spread, and it can cause airway obstruction. 
Okay. <clears throat> so we'll continue from where we stopped. Now, inflammatory goiters, of course, there are different types of inflammatory goiters. They present with pain, features of inflammation. You will see warmth, okay, redness of the overlying skin, tenderness, and there are various types. It could be acute superative thyroiditis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, that is autoimmune thyroiditis, okay, disease-specific thyroiditis, and various types and their classification. Okay, so these are the various types. When you talk about risk factors, risk factors usually depends on the type of the goiter. You can see there are various categories of goiter. The risk factors, as we mentioned, that will cause neoplastic goiters varies. And the risk factors that cause toxic goiters also vary. Now, we should know that for toxic goiters, exposure, uh, when you have deficiency of iodine, generally they can cause goiters, like simple goiters. When you have deficiency of iodine, since iodine is a substrate for production of this hormone, as they are deficient, um, the body tends to stimulate the follicle to produce the hormone, but the substrate is absent. Then the gland will tend to enlarge without producing hormone. So you see that in simple goiters. And usually this is common in area where there is risk factor, okay? Now, in cases where you have excessive goitrogens, goitrogens are substances that stimulate the growth of the gland. They can be found in our food, like excessive ingestion of cabbage, poorly processed cassavas, and even some drugs that will bind to, um, that will bind to iodine and prevent optic as well as synthesis of the hormone. So you need to know that. Then uh, when you talk about the malignant goiters, of course, um, you, you talk about exposure to radiation, you talk about um, long-standing goiter and so on. Now, the investigations will talk about diagnostic, how do they present generally? Now, we should know the presentations of anterior neck swelling they present with swelling in the anterior neck, which is noticed usually by a closed relative. Somebody will inform them that they notice a swelling of, on their neck. And this swelling may just be there, causing cosmetic deformity. This swelling might have symptoms of toxicity, okay? This swelling might have pressure symptoms which will be causing, okay, difficulty in breathing, difficulty in swallowing, change in voice. They may have malignant symptoms, which will compress on the trachea, infiltrate the recurrent laryngeal nerve. They may have distant metastases to the bones, okay? Now, then other symptoms, if it is toxic goiters, they may have symptoms of toxicity. We won't discuss the detail of all this because of time. Now investigations, if we are to do investigations for an anterior neck swelling, <clears throat> we want to do diagnostic, you do a thyroid function test. Okay. Know that you are assessing T3, T4, TSH. And sometimes you have to assess 
antithyroid antibody, thyroglobulin. malignant goiters they are elevated so for toxic goiters you have elevated t3 elevated t4 and depressed tsh for hypothyroidism you have depressed t3 depressed t4 and elevated TSH. Now, in thyroid malignancies, you have an elevated thyroglobulin. It's very important you know that. Thyroid, thyroglobulin is a tumor marker that shows elevated elevation that is elevated in the various types of malignancy. Now, <clears throat> it is important you know the difference between hypothyroidism and thyrotoxicosis. When you say hyperthyroidism, it is laboratory elevation of these values. That is hyperthyroidism. When you say thyrotoxicosis, is the clinical manifestations of thyrotoxicosis. Please, you should differentiate that, okay? Now, it is worth noting also that any time you see a patient, if you do a thyroid function test, this is very important, you know, especially for residents. Any time you see a patient, presenting with features of hypothyroidism. It is very, very important you assess for the thyroglobulin. It's very important you know that. Why is that so? Because up to 10% of patients with hypothyroidism will have malignancy. Is it clear? Up to 10% of patients with hypothyroidism which will have malignancy. And thyroglobulin is elevated in malignancy. So when you see features of hypothyroidism, you, you should add thyroglobulin. It's a tumor marker for malignant goiters. This is just by the way. Now, <clears throat> that is the first investigation we talked about. Now, we'll talk about some other investigations we talked about number one thyroid function test so number two you have to do ultrasound scan of the neck this ultrasound scan will tell you the origin it's originating from the thyroid gland it's going to tell you the nature whether it's cystic or solid okay it's going to tell you the actual size it will tell you the status of the lymph nodes of the neck. You know, when you start seeing an enlarged lymph node in the neck, you have to be worried. Now, somebody referred a patient for me. She, she was a young lady, okay? So when she came, uh, she came from National Hospital that uh, she has been on drug for a very long time. She has hypothyroidism and she's on drug. So, um, and there's an anterior neck swelling. I now look through all the investigations. I now saw there was no fine needle aspiration cytology and there was no thyroglobulin. So she's on just replacement. So I now counseled her that okay, this patient will need further evaluation. We cannot just place her on replacement saying, okay, she's hypothyroid. Uh, we've not confirmed whether this is a malignant goiter or whether uh, 
the tyroglobulin is elevated. So simply, I just requested for tyroglobulin, okay, even before sticking my needle there to take sample for cytology to confirm when it's malignant. So the essence of this, please and please you should know, um, when you see a goiter that is hypothyroid, don't forget to look for malignancy. And the essence of this ultrasound scan of the neck, you also look for lymph nodes in malignant, especially papillary. Said papillary spread via lymph nodes, okay? Uh, lymphatic, so they will be spread to the lymph nodes. So you do ultrasound scan, and these are the various rules of the ultrasound scan of the neck. Now, you do FNAC. Number three, you do fine needle aspiration cytology. This will take cells to assess whether you have benign or malignant, malignant lesion, okay? This is very, very important in your evaluation. We won't go into details because of time, okay? So you also do... Um, what is called laryngoscopy. You want to assess, you want to assess the state of the <clears throat> vocal cords for medical legal reasons, okay? You have questions, we'll attend to that later. Okay, so uh, aside that, uh, you have to do x ray of the neck. You have the AP and the lateral. Okay, so these, there are several other investigations you do, which we won't go into details of that because, of course, we've discussed this topic extensively and we still have the lecture there, okay? So, now the bottom line you should all know, if you are preparing for a picture test, you shouldn't leave all this area uncovered, okay? You have to know what that condition is. What are the types? What are the risk factors? How they present? Various investigations that are done Okay, treatments, treatment options for that condition. Okay, then the complications of the condition and the complications of the treatment. So we are going to move to the next. We won't go into detail. You can go back and check. If you have some specific questions, you can ask. Now, this is a groin swelling. Hernia, this is a hernia. Now, the definition, what is a hernia? A hernia is defined as an abnormal protrusion of a viscous. Okay, you should know it's an abnormal protrusion. Don't just say swelling, protrusion of a viscous. Okay, it's an abnormal protrusion of a viscous through a defect Okay, this defect is in the wall of its containing cavity now, When you are talking about um, any condition especially for residents. You should know your success of discussing any pathology is for you to be able to define it at a go. You cannot start talking about types of hernia without being able to define what hernia is, or you start telling me the risk factors for a hernia without knowing what it is. So you should know that 
is an abnormal protrusion, okay, of a viscous through a defect in the wall of its containing cavity. So that is very important. You know how to define it. <clears throat> now, for this particular image, what are the types? We defined it. Now you can see this is a what a groin hernia. Okay, and groin hernias usually there are three types of groin hernias. The three types of groin hernias are inguinal hernias, which could be direct or indirect, making two then femoral hernias. So that's you should know that hernias, groin hernias, it could be inguinal or femoral. The inguinal could be direct or indirect. Now, you should know groin hernias, inguinal hernias are the commonest types of groin hernias in both males and females. If you see this in your MCQs, you should know that inguinal hernias are the commonest types of hernias in both males and females. However, femoral hernias are commoner in females. Femoral hernias are commoner in females, even though, even though, Okay, even though inguinal hernias is still commoner than femoral hernias. You should know that. So this, but of course, from that image, uh, femoral hernia can, doesn't grow as large as that. And direct hernias do not grow down to the scrotum. So it's likely what? indirect hernias. When you say indirect hernia, what do you mean? Okay, the hernia, it is the external ring, the internal ring, the scrotum, the pubic symphysis. When you say indirect hernia, the hernia enters the inguinal canal from the deep ring. It comes out through the superficial ring. This is the superficial ring. Okay, and it enters the scrotum. That is indirect hernia. So indirect hernias are hernias that enters the inguinal canal through the deep ring. Don't forget. Indirect hernias are hernias that enters the inguinal canal through the deep ring. Okay, they enter the canal through the deep ring. Now, when you talk about um, direct hernias, they enter the canal through a weakness in the posterior, posterior wall of the inguinal canal, okay? Direct hernias enters the ring through a defect in the posterior wall through this part. Okay, there's a, a part that is called the Hesselbach's triangle. Okay, this Hesselbach's triangle is a triangle. Okay, here yeah. in the medial part of the okay, let me use another diagram for clarity. This is the pubic symphysis. You have the inguinal canal, the deep ring. Okay, the scrotum. Now there's a triangle here. It's a triangle here on the medial part. And this triangle on the medial part is weak. 
is called Hasselbach's triangle. It's bounded, okay, lateral. This lateral is medial. <clears throat> it's bounded lateral by inferior epigastric vessels, inferior epigastric vessels, medially by the lateral margin of the rectus muscle and inferiorly by the inguinal canal, inguinal ligament, sorry, inguinal ligament, rectus muscle. This wall is called the Hesperus triangle. Now that wall is weak and um, you could have protrusion of the viscous through the, that. And usually this is commoner in elderly people because of weakness in the posterior wall of the lower abdomen as compared to younger individuals, okay? Now, let's go back to indirect hernia because that image we saw is of indirect hernia. What are the types? of indirect hernia. I told you, indirect hernias enter the inguinal canal through the deep ring, while direct enters into the canal directly from a weakness in the posterior, um, uh, uh, posterior wall of the inguinal canal. Now, what are the types of indirect hernia? There are two types of indirect hernias. The two types of indirect hernias could be one, incomplete, and two, you have complete. When you say incomplete, indirect inguinal hernia, it means the hernia enters the inguinal canal, okay? through the deep ring, but it has not descended completely to the scrotum, okay? It comes out, it could be within the canal or it will exceed, or it has exceeded the superficial ring, but it has not descended down to the scrotum. That is an incomplete, indirect inguinal hernia. And there are two types of incomplete indirect inguinal hernia. If you have any question later, you will ask me. It could be bubunosil or funicular hernia. When you say bubunosil, it enters the inguinal canal through the deep ring. So the hernial sac is within the inguinal canal, it is called bubunosil. When you say funicular hernia, it has come out of the external ring. However, it has not descended down to the scrotum. That is called uh, a funicular hernia. Why a complete hernia, complete indirect inguinal hernia, it has descended down to the scrotum. So if you go back to our image, you will find, okay, that this image is what? If you look at this image, this image is a complete indirect inguinal hernia, okay? Now, the reason why you need to understand the picture so that any question that is asked around, you will be able to answer appropriately. If you don't understand the image or what is being projected, you might find it difficult to answer the questions correctly. Okay, so we've described the various, we've defined what a pioneer is. We've mentioned the various type based on the image. There are several ways of classifying hernias, but I restricted my classification to growing hernias because the image that is being that is presented is a growing hernia. Now, what are the risk factors for hernias? Usually, risk factors are those factors that will cause straining. When you say straining, it's what increase, okay, contraction or tension on the anterior abdominal wall. 
okay? This might be due to, it might be during defecation or lifting of heavy, heavy weight, okay? Urinating, coughing, and so on. All factors that will cause prolonged straining might cause, might cause hernias, okay? So one, you could have chronic cough, chronic constipation, bladder outlet obstruction, lifting of heavy weights, okay? Now, other factors could be weakness in the anterior abdominal wall, okay? There could be obesity, intraabdominal masses, ascites, and so on. Now, generally, you know, pathologies in, for surgical conditions could either be congenital or acquired. So there are some congenital hernias that will cause a complete indirect scrotal hernia. <clears throat> so, and you should, in the risk factors, you should be able to differentiate what a predisposing factor, especially for residents, and precipitating factors. All these are risk factors, predisposing factors and precipitating factors for hernias. When you say predisposing factors, there are those factors that are inherent in the patients that, that are risk, like obesity, connective tissue diseases, okay, weakness in the anterior abdominal wall, muscles, and so on. All these are factors that are inherent. Why precipitating factors are those factors that will increase intra-abdominal uh, pressure and cause, okay, straining. How do they present? They present with abnormal protrusion of the groin. This protrusion usually could return online or patient might manually return the swelling, okay? Now, this is a common presentation of hernias, they will tell you that this swelling protrudes when they lie down, it goes back, or they can manually reduce it, or in the morning, it disappears. But during the activities or while standing for a very long time, it protrudes, it protrudes. okay? So th this is a common presentation. Now, they can present as complications. Usually hernias are painless, except when they are complicated. Because the natural history of the hernia, when you are asked, what is the natural history of a hernia? They progressively increase in size because it's a defect. And as long as there is a mass that keeps on protruding through that defect. What happens? It will increase in size. So this is amongst the reasons, okay, you present to a patient while counseling the patient for hernia. Because, of course, if you go to some villages, they have some superstitious belief that, okay, related to hernias and hydrocell, and they will refuse to operate it. You have to counsel them properly, okay? You have to counsel them properly. There was a time I did a uh, two-month posting in a rural setting uh, where at Burnum Kudu, Federal Medical Center, Burnum Kudu, that is before I started re residency. When you go to those kind of settings, you will be amazed. You will see a hernia that is as big or hydrocyl. I saw a hydrocyl that is as big as half of that patient. 
And you can imagine how that patient have been carrying that swelling in his groin for many, many years. Why? Because of superstitious beliefs. If they start telling you the various beliefs, in fact, you will see a hydrocell that is a patient is carrying a hydrocell inside a truck to your office because it is so heavy that he cannot walk with the hydrocell. So you have to improvise a truck and he will put his scrotum inside the truck and just imagine a patient pushing a truck inside the office. Okay, he will scare you. So that is the superstitious beliefs that are related to all these things. So you have to counsel them that, okay, this will not bring any riches. You don't have any royal connection and all those nonsense. You tell them <clears throat> the reason why you have to operate them it's naturally grows when you, when you when you do not treat okay then secondly you have to cancel them various complications it can become obstructed and become an emergency okay it can become an emergency okay it can become irreducible. It can be so huge that this skin on the under surface can even ulcerate. It can present with what is called hernia with loss of domain, where most of the intra-abdominal content okay, will protrude into the sac and you cannot return that. Even during operation, when you just return the content in that case, the patient will die, of course, because the intra the peritoneal cavity has contracted. If you just return all the content of the hernia into the sac, it will present with raised intra-abdominal pressure, which will compress on the inferior vena cover and the venous return will reduce cardiac output, will reduce patient, will be in shock. The pressure will also compress it on the kidneys and the GFR will reduce. So many intra-abdominal uh, complications. So in a very huge hernia, like this particular one, this is called a giant hernia now. You say a hernia is giant when it has grown beyond the mid-tie of a patient in a standing position because it's image you are seeing this picture you don't imagine how huge this swelling is look at this knee these these are this man's knee if this man is standing in front of you probably you run away so this is a giant hernia because you can see it has grown beyond <clears throat> the mid time so they can present with all these features and they can present with complications. Now, investigations, the diagnosis of hernia is clinical. You should know that. The diagnosis of hernia is clinical. Investigations are done to look for an so that you eliminate risk factors. When you are doing chest x-ray for a patient that presents with hernia, you are looking for features of chest infection so that you treat. If you are doing abdominal ultrasound scan, you are looking at the size of the prostate, the post-voidal residual urine, okay, intra-abdominal masses, ascites, and so on and so forth. So investigation primarily is to look for and eliminate risk factor. Treatment is hernioraphy. You do hernioraphy after elimination of the risk factor. The reason why you need to eliminate risk factor if you don't eliminate them, it's a cause of recurrence. Now, for resident doctors, please, you go and read the various types of aneurysm. Please, the Bassini, your assignment will be Bassini aneurysm. And what is the difference between the original Bassini and the modified Bassini? There are various types of aneurysm. You have the Bassini repair, the shoulders repair, the nylon dan, the Liechtenstein repair, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, you have to go and um, check all those things. And of course, for the resident doctor, 
you know how to classify paneography. This is not for undergraduate, the anterior approach, posterior approach, laparoscopic open and all those things. Now, the third image we are going to consider is of breast cancer. Now, usually, look at this image. You can see there is breast asymmetry. Anytime if a woman presents with a breast lump to you and you are examining that patient, you need to do a comparative inspection of both breasts. Of course, you look at both breasts, the sizes, okay, the position of the nipples, you can see this nipple is at a lower level. This other nipple is retracted upward. You can see this breast tissue completely is retracted upward because, you know, in malignant swelling, because there's infiltration of the surrounding tissue, it will tend to retract all the breast tissue toward itself. So even the nipple will be retracted. Okay, so there's nipple retraction. Now, you can see the smaller size moving closer to the chest, a lot of dimpling, nipple destruction, and swelling of the ipsilateral arm. Meaning, whatsoever the case may be here, there is obstruction of the lymphatics in this axilla. There is reduction in drainage. Generally, when you see malignant cells or cancers, okay, you have abnormal disorganized growth of cells that goes beyond the basement membrane. Okay, when any lesion, you should know this, any lesion that breaches the basement membrane is malignant. Malignant lesion never confined within a basement membrane. If they are malignant and they still confined within basement membrane, they are called carcinoma in situ. When the process of carcinogenesis commences, they will invade the basement membrane. They will now spread to a distant site, which is called metastasis. And the process of spread could either be hematogenous through blood, it could be direct, it could be via lymphatics. Those are the various means by which malignant lesions can spread. Now, you should know the difference between breast cancer and carcinoma of the breast. You should know the difference between these two. When you say carcinoma of the breast, it's a malignant breast lesion that arises from epithelial cells. When you say carcinoma, it's a type of malignancy that arise from epithelial cells. And it's the commonest type, and they are the ones that spread through lymphatics. When you say cancer, okay, is a broad term. So they could arise from mesenchymal tissue. <clears throat> and they are spread usually is via hematogenous commonly. Now, there are various types of breast cancer, okay? It could either be invasive, non-invasive. These are the two categories of breast cancer. When you say invasive or non-invasive. Now, when you say a cancer is non-invasive, it is limited within 
the basement membrane, and hence it is called carcinoma in situ. When it is invasive, it has gone beyond the basement membrane, and the process of carcinogenesis has set in, it will now spread to a distant site. For both invasive and non-invasive carcinomas, they are further classified as either ductal or lobular. Because the breast tissue is made up of both ductal tissue and lobular tissue. Now, it now depends on where the malignancy is arising from, but majority of breast cancer arise from ductal tissue. So you should know and don't forget this. Invasive ductal carcinomas are the commonest types of breast cancer. There are various pathological subtypes, which we will not go into that, okay? Because that is a very detailed discussion, which we have the lecture on our YouTube page. If you want to go into details of that, you can go and watch that. Now, what are the risk factors for breast cancer? Generally, you should know, only 30% of patients with breast cancer are present with a risk factor aside the age and sex. Most of them will present without a known risk factor. Okay? The commonest two I mentioned, sex is 100 times commoner in females than males. Age, it's commoner generally in women that have aged above 35 years. So you see cancers from 45 years and above generally. It's rare in patients that are less than 35 years, okay? You see cancers you see in patients that are less than 20 years is very rare, less than 5%. When you see cancer in younger individuals, not even breast cancer alone, you should know that they have hereditary components and they are very aggressive. Okay, when you see malignancy in younger individuals, it's not something you should take lightly, okay? Now, now I said only 30% will present with risk factors aside age and sex. Majority of them, 70% are sporadic. What are other risk factors aside age and sex? Other risk factors will include genetic factors. When there are mutations of some genes, these genes commonly the BRCA1, breast cancer antigen or breast cancer gene, BRCA2. These are tumor suppressor genes. There are several other uh, genes which we won't go into that. It's for you to understand the concept. These genes, they are called tumor suppressor. They suppress any tumor formation when they is displaced they are in cells. What they do, they strike them out from progressing into malignancy. Now, when there are mutations in these genes, so you see, the genes that check abnormal cells from progressing into malignancy are defective. So the patient will tend to um, develop cancer. And this mutation can be inherited. When a patient inherits a mutated gene, it is called a genetic breast cancer or hereditary breast cancer because there is a known gene mutation that is inherited. It is called a hereditary breast cancer and they account for up to 20% of breast cancers. Now, there are some familial breast cancers 
that runs in family without an isolated gene. So that is the difference between hereditary and um, familial breast cancer. So we've talked about age, we've talked about sex, we've talked about genetic factors, prolonged exposure to estrogen, early menarche, less than 12 years, late menopause, more than 55 years is a risk factor. Okay. Now, prolonged exposure to estrogen. We said early menarche, late menopause. Okay, that is one. Use of estrogen containing oral contraceptives. When you use contraceptive pills that contain estrogen, it's a risk factor for breast cancer. Okay. Age at first pregnancy and live birth. Those women whose pregnancy, their first pregnancy is after the age of 35 years, they have higher risk of developing breast cancer because of <clears throat> exposure. They have been exposed to estrogen for a very long time, several cycles. Okay. Nulliparity, women that have never given birth have higher risk of breast cancer. Okay, nulliparous women. Duration of breastfeeding is protective. Any lady that or any woman that breastfeeds her child for less than one year that is regarded as short duration of breastfeeding. Those who breastfeed their children for more than one year, that is protective against breast cancer. Okay? Yes. All these are exposure to pro prolonged exposure to estrogen. Those women that use hormone replacement because of menopausal symptoms, they have higher risk breast cancer, exposure to radiation, therapeutic radiation for treating lymphomas, mantle radiation is a risk factor, okay? Yes, when there are benign breast diseases in the past, not all benign breast diseases are risk factors. Those with atypical hyperplasia, okay, are risk factor for breast cancer. Then when a patient Obesity is a risk factor, okay? Especially those in the postmenopausal period. When you have obese women in their postmenopausal period, they have higher risk of developing breast cancer. So, but you should know that most of these obese women carry their obesity from premenopausal to postmenopausal period. Don't say, okay, because I'm obese. Even though, of course, obesity in the premenopausal period is not a risk, but most of the time they fail to reduce this weight and they carry it along to the postmenopausal. You know, some cultures, some women will deliberately want to get obese so that they will say, okay, their husband is feeding them. You want me to go back to my family and say, I'm suffering in my husband's house. Please tell them that they are predisposing themselves to breast cancer, not even breast cancer, other comorbidities. So there are some cultures, when you see the kind of regimen they prepare for them in their early ages of marriage, within one or two years, you will not recognize them again, okay? Because their husband is feeding them well. So please, you should counsel them that they should maintain a normal BMI because of risk of not only breast cancer, other comorbidities, okay? Then other form of lifestyle like alcohol ingestion, smoking and so on, they are all risk factors of breast cancer, okay? Now previous breast cancer increases the risk of breast cancer. Family history of breast cancer in first degree related increase the risk of breast cancer up to three times. 
Okay, I've seen a lot of patients with family history of breast cancer with increased increased anxiety. Okay, increased anxiety because <clears throat> they have increased risk for breast cancer. So in those patients, you should know their surveillance or monitoring is you have to monitor them carefully. Okay, so that without early screening and early detection they, you might miss it and you should know breast cancer is curable please don't have this misconception that anybody with breast cancer is dead no it's a disease that you can cure completely but with a condition that one you should detect it early because if it goes beyond the stage of cure you might not achieve cure. However, we won't go into that. There are so many things going on about achieving cure in this disease. You'll be surprised the extent of how people go in research in genomics, trying to map out those genetic factors that will determine how you even treat the patient. Not our own type of things we we'll just do theory paperwork and so on you go and submit and become something and they will ask you questions that you can't answer okay so they present commonly with uh they present commonly with a lump in the breast you should know that a lump is the commonest presentation of breast cancer now, you see from experience, and please take this very carefully, you have to pay attention. Most of these patients, especially the less enlightened women, because the lump is painless, they refuse to come to the hospital. When you have a lump that is painless, that is the one that is even more dangerous because breast cancer do not present with pain okay they do not present with painful breast lumps except in some certain conditions which we may talk about later so they will refuse to present because when you ask them because severally i ask them why they will say no it has been there for six months but there is no pain there was a patient i treated the mom she came to the hospital she was the caregiver six months later she presented to me that doctor last time you were treating my mom i was feeling a lump in my breast and lo and behold when i examined her it was already an advanced malignancy with skin involvement i asked her when i was treating your mom was it there she said of course it was there why didn't you come she said it was painless so you should remember breast lumps that are painless okay especially in women that are more than 35 years you have to pay careful attention so breast lumps are commonest presentation they can present with nipple discharge commonly bloody nipple discharge they can have other form of nipple discharges like serous nipple discharge okay yes they could present with skin changes dimpling tethering pederange ulceration okay nipple destruction nipple deviation nipple destruction okay and several other presentations they could present with lymphedema of the arm as in this patient on the image because of obstruction of the lymphatics they may present with features of distant metastasis now briefly we won't go into other treatment what you should know that evaluation of breast cancer is via triple assessment triple assessment is clinical please i'm emphasizing this if you are not taking anything from this lecture or if you are sleeping wake up evaluation of any breast lump is via 
clinical, radiological, okay, and pathological. That is histology. This is called triple assessment. Any patient that presents to you with breast lump, don't just go ahead because you are one super surgeon, you just infiltrate and remove the lump and the result will come out and it tells you malignant. And what have you done? One, you have upgraded the disease. Two, you have denied that patient of breast conservative surgery, okay? So many things you have uh, lost. In a nutshell, you have mismanaged that patient. So any patient that presents to you with a breast lump, you must assess them clinically. That is by taking history and physical examination. Two, you do imaging, mammography for those that are more than 35 years, or ultrasound scan for those that are less than 35 years. Then pathological evaluation, you take biopsy for histology. So these are called triple assessments, okay? So what are the investigative modalities? Okay, you have to do biopsy, you have to take tissue for biopsy, okay, to make one histological diagnosis. You want to know the tumor grade and you want to know the receptor status whether it is estrogen positive, progesterone positive, hatunu positive, okay? Then other investigations like imaging and investigations to look for distance spread or staging of the disease. Now, the details of breast cancer is on other lectures on the page. You can go and revisit for details because of time. Then treatment options, also there are various treatment options, but you should know the gold standard for treatment is surgery because it removes the lesion, okay? And when we say surgery, please have it in mind. We, I'm, not, I'm not saying mastectomy, removing the breast, no. There are various surgical options. It could be breast conserving surgery. In early breast cancer, you don't just go and remove somebody's breast. Ah, I did histology is malignant. Madam, we have to remove your breast or you will die. We have gone beyond that era, okay? There's one of my colleagues that came. She, she's an oncologist. She went for training on breast cancer. When she came back, she said, but she, nobody removes breast again. Even in locally advanced breast cancer, they downstage and give a breast conservative surgery. So you guys have to change your practice. Nobody is removing breasts, okay? So surgery doesn't mean you remove breasts. It could be breast conserving surgery. It could be a, a mastectomy. There are various types of mastectomy, which we won't go into that, okay? Then um, you could have chemotherapy, radiotherapy, targeted therapy, immunotherapy. These are the various types or modalities of treatment. So I think, I don't know if we can continue uh, the lecture. It's already past 10. Uh, if there is time, maybe tomorrow we are going to continue. So um, I will allow all of you to unmute yourself in the next 10 minutes, we are going to entertain questions um, and answer. So if you have any question, clarifications, contributions, you can unmute yourself, then you ask, then we discuss. Thank you very much for participating. So I'll be waiting for your question. You can unmute yourself and ask question. Thank you.
Are we together? Yes, sir. So, sir, I'm having a uh, question, yes. even though uh, it's not part of the uh, presentation, but I want to know uh, the occurrence of uh, hydrocyl, which is uh, common in which uh, age group, the adult or the children. Why do you want to confuse me? Did I mention hydrocyl today? Sir, that's why I say it's not part of the lecture. <laughs> Because we have talked about the hernias, so that is what's coming in my okay, mind. We talked about hernias. We are going to discuss hydrocele. I think it's on the outline. There are various types of hydrocele. It could be communicating, okay, or non-communicating hydrocele. When you say communicating hydrocele, it communicates between, okay, the peritoneal cavity and the scrotum. So there is persistent processus vaginalis, okay? So it is the peritoneal fluid that comes in to the uh, processus vaginalis and forms a hydrocele because there is persistent. And this that are seen can also be classified into various types, okay? We, we are going to discuss that in detail Okay, there is infantile insisted hydrocele of the cord, okay, and so on. But what is your question you said? The, the occurrence of uh, I mean, the occurrence of uh, hydrocele. Yes. Uh, which age group has the highest uh, number of uh, it, can, it can occur in the pediatric age group, which is communicating hydrocele. It can also occur in the adult age group, okay? which is non-communicating or vaginal hydrocele. When you say vaginal hydrocele, you know the testis has a covering called tunica vaginalis. So the secretion of fluid from the tunica vaginalis, okay, within that is enclosing the testis. So you have hydrocele that is called vaginal hydrocele. While in the pediatric age group, it's um, the communicating type, usually due to processors vaginalis. You have, um, okay, you have the peritoneal cavity, okay, and um, this is the scrotum. You have processors, persistent processors vaginalis the peritoneal fluid comes into the scrotum. So it's called communicating, okay? Now congenital hydrocele, generally, okay? You can just have this infantile type. You can have obliteration of this part and this part. And you now have something like this within the cord, it is called insisted hydrocele of the cord. This is the testis. Okay. It could persist completely, okay? Now you could have obliteration of all this place and it forms vaginal hydrocele. So there are various types. So the occurrence, it could either be in pediatric age group, it could also occur in the adult age group. The causes are different, okay? Now, some congenital hydrocele might progress to adulthood if they are not treated, okay? And it fails to obliterate. While some other hydrocele in adulthood will result from infection, various types of infections, okay? So it's not that you see it in children and you don't see it in adults. You can see it in both ages. I don't know if that is clear. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other question, please? Okay, no question. So I believe is. Is either everything is clear? It's, when you don't have question, there are, there are either there are two possibilities. Is it is maybe you don't understand everything we discussed, 
or you understood everything. Of course, you see, Ahmed have proved that because he's asking question on hydrosil. So it's either he did not understood all what we said, or he understood everything. But by the way, I know some of you are sleeping because you are tired, it's fasting. So let us just call it a day here. And inshallah, uh, we are going to continue possibly tomorrow so that we can cover as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, sir.